All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our very first Brain Up webinar. Um, and thank you, Laura, for helping setting this up. Hopefully, everything will run smoothly and we'll have an interesting discussion at the end of the talk. Um, right, so I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Enrietta Howells. Enrietta is a postdoctoral researcher in the Laboratory of Motor Control, Department of Medical Biotechnology and Translational Medicine in the Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan, Italy. She obtained her PhD from King's College, London, where she focused on neuroanatomy and diffusion imaging tractography. She now works on integrating uh, electrophysiology, neuroimaging, and neuropsychology to study white matter connections in patients undergoing awake surgery from brain tumors. Today, she will talk about the role of wake surgery in studying function, um, functions of white matter connection. Um, and so before I hand the mic to, uh, over to Ada, I just want to remind, as Laura just said, that if you have any questions for our speaker, um, please feel free to send it through the Q&A tab, and we'll be answering questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Etta. Thanks, Chiara. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm delighted that I can present this um, virtually, um, if not in person. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a shame, but it's nice to try this format. Um, and I'm sure this will be one of many webinars um, that continue. So um, I'm going to be speaking to you about awake neurosurgery. And what's interesting um, is that there, were, there is a point, there was a point at which um, one would never use the term awake neurosurgery. Um, because neurosurgery was always performed awake. So if you have a look at this um, selection of pictures, um, these are all paintings that date back, um, the earliest is from the end of the 12th century, um, and they're all from all over the world, um, neurosurgery being performed. And in all cases, um, the patient is always awake. And really, um, it was only um, towards the end of World War II um, that uh, anesthesiology was developed to the point at which um, it was possible to make patients asleep when they did neurosurgery. Uh, and this then became integrated um, into routine clinical practice. And the reason for this is that um, it gives the surgeon um, and the anesthesiologist a degree of um, control over the operation, um, control over the physiological parameters like blood pressure, um, it protects the airwaves, um, the airways in case of vomiting or um, other, other problems during surgery. Um, it reduces, therefore, the risk. Um, and it's also much less uh, distressing for the patient, of course. Um, and it also allows the surgeon then to concentrate very much on the operation. So um, this picture on the left actually is from um, Boston, I believe. It should be somewhere on display in the medical school. So um, I don't know, maybe you've seen it. Um, and so the uh, question remains, um, why bother using awake surgery at all? Now, um, the argument is that um, in order to preserve, pre pre preservation of function generally um, is one of the core um, objectives in neurosurgery generally. Um, the surgeon always wants to minimize post-operative deficits as far as possible. Uh, and when performing supratentorial surgery, it's not always enough to, re to rely on anatomical landmarks um, to find uh, functionally relevant cortex, which is called eloquent cortex. Um, and although um, this, uh, well, this approach um, is being used mainly in epilepsy surgery, um, this was the original um, popularity of, of this approach, uh, direct electrical stimulation um, is applied um, with a probe, which you can see on the left, um, to different areas of the cortex and um, the effect on behavior is recorded. Penfield um, was one of the most memorable people to use this approach um, and he produced probably the most popular uh, functional map um, showing the effect of electrical stimulation, um, producing the uh, motor and somatosensory homunculus. Um, and so by um, stimulating different sites, he produced either muscle contractions in different body parts um, or the patient self-reported a loss of feeling. Um, and these maps um, created these uh, homunculus representations. And actually this was done awake, um, but is now used as a guide often for a sleep surgery. Um, but the other interesting thing that emerged from the epilepsy field um, is also that uh, motor control is not just a positive, is not just, doesn't just produce, simulation doesn't just produce a positive effect, um, it can also produce a negative effect. 
So um, while the patient is performing ongoing movements, um, in the case of the studies done by Luders, um, when the patient um, makes repetitive um, flexion and extension of the arm and stimulation is applied um, in the inferior frontal cortex um, or the pre SMA, the movement is stopped. So this is often termed a negative effect, a negative motor effect. So you can have both positive motor effects and negative motor effects and weight surgery has provided um, this information for us. Um, and what's interesting is that actually um, the use of awake surgery in epilepsy um, has reduced, but in fact the um, use of awake surgery in glioma surgery, uh, the, the, uh, the awake surgery for gliomas um, has increased since the 1990s. Uh, and there's two reasons for this. Um, one is that when you have um, a glioma, you want to resect as much of it as possible. Um, and the use of direct electrical stimulation um, allows you to push the boundary of the resection. Um, and this then allows you to um, enhance life expectancy. So in this graph, you can see below, you can see that the, um, the more of the, um, the uh, resection is performed, the, the, the larger the resection, uh, the greater the survival probability. Um, and so this, using direct electrical stimulation, gives you these what, what's called a functional border to the resection. Um, and this is much better than an anatomical um, border. It allows you to push the um, boundary. Um, and the other thing is that um, a range of intraoperative tests have been developed um, to test different cognitive functions. So this uh, graph here shows the results of a systematic review. Um, and so it takes you up to the end of, I think it's the end of the 2017, um, showing the um, types of uh, cognitive tests that are done um, intraoperatively um, for different functions. Um, so of this, you can see that the majority of uh, language, but there's also tests um, performed to preserve visual spatial functions, uh, memory, calculation, um, and many other things. So um, really, What's the, the purpose of awake surgery um, for gliomas um, is to achieve what's called the neuro-oncological balance. So this is um, trying, to, um, trying to push the extent of resection while preserving functions as much as possible. Um, so you have this balance between life expectancy and quality of life. Um, and this relies on two uh, major things um, that I'm going to go into in a bit more detail. So the first um, is that we need to know um, what cognitive functions should be tested in what area. And this has to be known both on the cortical and the subcortical level. Um, and the second thing that we need to know um, is that these tests are definitely reliable. So we need to know um, that the tests are actually going to be um, producing something that is reproduced, is, is appropriate um, in the neurosurgical setting. And the difficulty is that um, the normal um, neuropsychological setting would be within the clinic. Um, you've got enough time to be able to do lots of trials. You've got um, the opportunity to do control trials and you can do quite complex things with patients. But when you wake a patient up in the intraoperative setting, you need something that's incredibly easy to administer very quickly. Uh, each trial matters. Um, it's very difficult to add any kind of control trial um, and you need something that's easy for the neuropsychologist to administer for the neuros and easy for them to report to the neurosurgeon. Um, you need a very simple test um, so that the patient doesn't make any mistakes um, and so that you're sure that you're actually testing the specific cognitive function that you're interested in. So I'm going to come back to each of these two points. Um, clearly, we wouldn't be here if we knew what all of the different functions of each cortical and subcortical area were. Um, however, there are some general principles of brain organization that are relevant. Um, so we can use certain tools um, to try and help us. So we can use um, fMRI, we can use resting state fMRI, uh, task fMRI, resting state fMRI, we can use TMS. Um, and these are all tools that allow us to look um, really more at cortical function. Um, the only information really we can get from for subcortical function is more indirect. So um, that's more related to looking at um, uh, lesion studies, um, that's, that's usually one way of understanding it. Um, but really, um, I'm going to make another point here, which is um, while there, there are different approaches for looking at, at function, um, and what's incredibly relevant for glioma surgery is to look at connectional anatomy. 
So we can look at function in terms of um, deep brain structures um, on the left. We can look at um, the surface and try and parcelate it uh, and look at different functions and localize them for different areas. But what's really very important is the connections between different regions um, and what they do. So um, this is particularly relevant, of course, um, for gliomas because they are subcortical. Um, by definition, they, they have to be um, originating subcortically. So the approach to resection differs a lot from epilepsy surgery, um, as this is limited to a cort the cortex. So here you're doing um, strictly cortical mapping, or usually cortical mapping, actually. Um, but with glioma surgery, you are just as interested in what's going on subcortically as cortically. So this leads on to an important point that I want to make about um, brain organization. Um, the function of the brain is, um, is linked directly to its an anatomy um, and to its connectional anatomy, I would argue. So um, the role of each cortical area in a certain function um, should be the result of its interaction with other cortical areas via white matter connections. So there's a wider network that's involved. This is a nice summary um, of that um, in a nice paper by uh, my old boss in London, um, showing that there's different approaches to understanding brain organization. If you have a localizationist approach, um, so each cortical area is responsible for a different function. Then you have a lesion in a specific area, and that um, specific area's lesion leads to that specific deficit. If you regard the brain as all working together equally, um, and no area is specialized for any specific thing, then a lesion in a specific area is causing um, an effect across the widespread network. Um, and that's what is, uh, that's what, why you're gonna have a specific deficit. Or if you think of the uh, brain as being organized um, as sets of connections between different regions um, that are specialized for different things, then a lesion in an area is going to have a knock-on effect on the other areas that are connected um, directly. Um, and this approach can be called the associationist theory. So if we go back to our um, tumor on the right, just as an example, um, if you have a look at that tumor um, on the brain um, over Broca's area here, you see um, that you could say that this is um, just a co the, the cortical area that should be mapped. But when you're doing the tumor surgery, in fact, you can see that there are a range of um, subcortical connections that should be taken into account. So this is also nicely summarized in a um, study done by Nina Dronkers um, that was published in Brain. So the brain that you can see here um, is the immortal, uh, pr very carefully preserved brain um, that lives in Paris um, of the patient, uh, Monsieur Le Bourne, um, who was Broca's patient. And this patient, um, uh, was only able to say tan, um, so it had a classic um, Broca's aphasia. Uh, and when this patient was autopsied, uh, Broca observed that there was this very clear damage in the left posterior inferior frontal gyrus, um, and so he said this is a center for speech. So um, Nina Dronkers took the brain and did an MRI and showed that in fact there was a lot more widespread white matter damage going on there. Um, and in a later collaboration, um, we took this brain and we used an atlas of healthy white matter um, to look at the connections. Um, and you can see a very similar image here to the one that I showed you in the previous slide. So actually there are these very stereotyped sets of connections within the brain. Um, and the, uh, the effect of the um, lesion in this patient had affected a whole host of other connections with other regions, other cortical areas. And just as a side note, um, we had a look at some other famous cases. I recommend you read the paper if um, you're interested in more into this. Um, the uh, skull of Phineas Gage was used to estimate um, which connections had been affected. And you can see a whole load of um, frontal lobe connections had been resected um, or damaged by the lesion. Um, and in patient HM, um, it wasn't just the hippocampi, um, it was also a whole set of other limbic structures, um, the unsin at the fornix, um, the cingulum, that were also affected. So um, the, the point, I hope I've convinced you um, that it's very important um, to look at subcortical connectivity, particularly in neurosurgery, in all types of um, neurosurgery, but particularly 
the surgery of gliomas. And now um, I want to come back to this point. So um, it's very important um, in order to co correctly map the brain to have uh, reliable neuropsychological testing. Um, and this systematic review um, shows very clearly that there is a huge bias towards um, language mapping. And there's a few reasons for this. Uh, losing language ability um, has a big impact on post-operative quality of life. Uh, so after movement, uh, preserving language is really the main focus of a neurosurgeon. Gliomas are also very commonly located um, in language relevant regions. Um, so they're often around um, perisylvian peri areas. Um, and so they affect, they can potentially affect language. But also language is left lateralized. Um, and so if you have a glioma in a uh, dominant hemisphere um, and you damage it, it's possible that the other hemisphere can't compensate. Um, and so uh, that's the other reason that it's focused on. Um, however, it's important to remember that um, quality of life uh, after surgery is linked to a lot more than just being able to move or speak. Um, we need to be able to regulate ourselves properly um, in different situations, behave flexibly. Um, it's important to have a sense of ourselves, to have a sense of others. And um, when it comes to motor and language function, we really need to be able to do this properly. Um, it's fine to be able to speak, but if you um, aren't getting the sense of what's being said or you aren't expressing yourself properly, um, this is a problem, even when it's a fine grained problem, um, it impacts on your um, sense of self. But also you need to be able to, even if you can move, um, you also need to be able to use, um, to interact properly with um, the environment. You need to be able to use tools, you need to be able to type, um, you need to be able to interact properly. So in Milan, um, we've been trying to develop various new tests um, to look at uh, different cognitive functions um, to improve mapping, um, but also to try and look at the um, different effects of those. So um, looking at clin the clinical impact, but also looking um, at the scientific, the scientific side of things. So having a look at the structural connections as well. And I haven't got time to go through um, lots of the studies that we've been doing, but I just put two references there. Um, if you're interested. Um, on the left, we were using the um, Stroop test, um, just a simple neuropsych test interoperatively um, and looking at the connections involved. Um, and on the right, um, our group were looking at um, awareness um, during movement, um, which is sort of linked to anisognosia. Um, and so both of those studies are worth a read. Um, but my focus has been on um, looking at, recently has been looking at white matter connections um, relating to more complex aspects of motor control, which ties into a number of studies that have been done cortically by our group. Um, so I thought I would just take you through um, that uh, for the next 40 minutes, half an hour or so. So um, this image here um, is, uh, I, I love this image um, as a, person that studies um, connections. Um, because for me, it really summarizes why it's important um, to study motor control, um, and particularly to study motor control um, with awake surgery. So I found this in um, Roger Lemon and Robert Porter's book, um, which is one of the sort of Bibles of motor control um, for all uh, motor scientists. And it shows um, afferent and efferent connections uh, running from um, cerebral cortex towards the spinal cord, um, connections uh, with other basal ganglia structures, th thalamic structures um, to, with the cerebellum um, and with brainstem structures. And the thing that really stands out to me is that there is absolutely no um, indication that there's any communication um, within um, the cerebrum. Uh, or within between cortical cortical areas, which I think is um, very interesting. And this is particularly interesting because in the monkey, um, this network has been very clearly defined. Um, so this is a really nice review um, that summarizes a lot of the work that they were doing in, have been doing in Palmer, um, showing that there's a whole host of cortical cortical connections involved in different aspects of sensory motor integration, um, which allows us to plan movement appropriately. Um, so these are not really motor output circuits, these are motor control circuits. This allows us 
and integrate um, incoming information appropriately to be able to interact properly with the environment. Um, and you can see that our model, although we, we have been making some progress um, on this, there isn't that much causal information yet um, looking at the cortico-cortical connections um, for hand motor control. Um, and this is also interesting because it's probably a lot more complicated in the human. Uh, we have a, a lot far more competent hands. Um, we're also able to do a much greater range of um, things with our hands um, and plan much more complex actions with our hands as well. So this network is likely to be far more complicated than the circuit in the monkey. And why is it important to study these things? Uh, well, hemiplegia um, is directly linked to resection of the corticospinal tract, so motor output circuits. But actually, a whole host of other motor syndromes can occur when you lesion other regions that are distant from motor output. Um, so it's likely that many of these are caused by disconnection um, of either corticocortical connections or connections between these distant regions and subcortical structures. So there's a lot more to look at than just um, uh, basic motor output circuits. So um, just bringing this back to um, this paper um, that I referenced before, um, and uh, the um, Michelle Thibault de Schotten and, and their group have did a nice study um, having a look at anosognosia for hemiplegia. So this is where you lose awareness of your motor deficits, quite a transient deficit that often happens after stroke, and showed that there's a range of um, connections that are actually damaged um, in, patient, in, the, in patients that have um, this syndrome. So it seems as though these motor control um, problems, some of them may be disconnection syndromes. So this is why it's relevant to really try and understand um, what's going on. So if we want to have a look at motor control in a clinical setting, as I mentioned um, earlier on, you can have either positive or negative motor effects. So um, the positive motor effect, you stimulate um, you presume that you are stimulating either directly or indirectly a corticomotor neuronal fiber, and that causes a muscle contraction in the hand. But you can also have this negative motor effect. Um, and this was um, studied in the epilepsy um, literature um, uh, in these patients, showing um, that you can have this negative motor effect, um, which is where the voluntary movement is disrupted, is interrupted. Um, and instead you have um, the, the, the ongoing movement is stopped. And this is, was um, studied in detail in, the, in epileptic patients, but recently has also been um, studied in glioma patients. And uh, a recent um, study that came out by uh, Defoe and colleagues um, showed that these effects could be found all over um, the precentral gyrus, in fact. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this um, is that they report, they use the same sort of approach. So it was a very binary distinction between um, is the movement still going when you stimulate or is the movement stopping when you stimulate? And it was a very, this binary distinction was used um, and it shows that there is this widespread effect, but perhaps there's a, a lot, bit more subtlety in there. Um, and if there was a way of quantitatively measuring um, what was going on. It may be able to provide us with a bit more information um, as to the specific aspect of the movement that's being disrupted. So um, our group developed um, an interoperative tool to try and do this. Um, and this was specifically targeted on hand motor control. So the aim was to try and find a way to look um, at the effect of stimulation on um, simple hand movements, not really, um, not really recruiting the upper limb, or the more, um, we just wanted to look at the hand um, and, and maybe the wrist a little bit, but the grasping movement was our interest. So um, this tool requires the patient to grasp, hold and rotate um, an object that sort of simulates a sort of screwdriver like um, movement. And the movement's continuous um, and the patient performs it throughout their, um, that, that section of the surgery. Um, and stimulation is applied and um, that movement stops. And then when the stimulation is removed, um, the patient's hand starts moving again. So just to show you an example of that, um, you can see here, when the stimulation is applied, the movement stops. Um, and then as soon as it's removed, then the hand starts moving again. <laughs> 
Um, and in each case, the, this is done um, once, you see that effect, um, and then the, the surgeon moves around and tests other areas, um, and then moves back and checks it three times um, to be sure. It's usually two to three times at least um, that they're sure that um, this effect is repeatable. So clinically, um, uh, our group did a study to compare whether this, um, the use of this tool intraoperatively to try and find these functional borders was actually useful um, in preventing deficits. So they compared two groups, um, a group of 41 patients, um, it was a retrospective study who, um, who, for which this task was used, was not used, sorry, um, and a group of 79 patients for which this task was used. So the introduction of this tool um, was incorporated into um, surgery and they compared the effect. And so what was clear was that the, um, although the rates of motor deficit after surgery were quite low in both the groups, the rates of idiomotor apraxia um, were massively reduced in the group um, that used the hand manipulation tool. Um, and furthermore, um, the rates of somatosensory deficit um, also decreased. So it seems as though um, this tool is actually doing something useful. Um, but it also raised some interesting questions. Um, was this stimulation always the same, uh, depending on where you stimulate? And also, um, anatomically, where do you find um, these effects? So there's an important point to make here, which is that um, all of these negative effects are not equal. Um, in fact, when you have a look at the EMG, you can see sometimes quite different things happening um, that can be recorded that are different from what you observe clinically. So the behavioral, um, the, the behaviorally defined approach is not always the best way of studying um, if you have it studying motor control. If you have the opportunity to record EMG, then why wouldn't you? Because it allows you to actually have a measurable physiological parameter um, and gives you a much clearer indication of what's going on. So here um, you can see, I'm going to show you um, a few videos that show this more clearly. So as the um, movement is rhythmic, um, it's possible to quantitatively, um, quantitatively compare the phasic muscle activity um, during task execution um, in a period, a time window without stimulation and a time window um, during stimulation. And you can see very clearly um, that there's a difference and you can quantitatively compare them um, and look at statistics to try and evaluate that. So here uh, is a video that will show um, the, the classic effect. So you have a hand arrest and you have a loss of muscle activity. Whereas here you have an, an arrest, but in fact you have muscle activity. So the behavioral uh, observation would be that that is an arrest, but actually it seems that there's something else going on. But also you can have a things. So here, for example, you have the arrest of the hand, um, but you actually have a recruitment in the, um, uh, in the, in the forearm muscle. So it's, it, the, using EMG, um, the message of this is that using EMG can give you um, quite interesting uh, things that gives you slightly more subtle information about what's going on. So um, to start with, we examined um, the hand region of the precentral gyrus. So we know very well um, in the monkey um, that there is a distinction across the surface of the um, precentral gyrus in the anterior posterior direction. Um, so this has been uh, described as a distinction between the new and the old M1, where the new M1 um, uh, hosts uh, cortical motor neuronal fibers, um, whereas the old M1, um, which is more anterior, because um, it's also corticospinal fibers, but they're not motor neuronal. Um, and this distinction, this has a functional relevance as well. In a human, this hasn't been shown so clearly. However, it is clear that there is um, both a functional and a cytoarchitectonic gradient um, across the surface of the precentral gyrus, so um, in the hand area. So in the top, um, you can see uh, the results of a meta-analysis that show quite clearly um, that you have it's sort of distinction across the um, border. And in fact, the surface of the precentral um, gyrus and precentral cortex in the hand area may be more um, linked to maybe a, a dorsal premotor area um, rather than a, um, an area involved in direct motor, cortical motor neuronal output. 
Uh, and again, you can see that in the bottom figure, um, this paper by the um, Carl Zillers group show that you can, there's a, a distinction along um, the anterior posterior, in the anterior posterior direction um, of the precentral gyrus, showing that there's different um, uh, types of fibers within there. And so what we did was we looked at 13 patients um, that un underwent awake surgery for a right hemisphere um, lesion. And the reason we looked in the right hemisphere patients um, was because uh, in the left hemisphere, we have to dedicate more time to language mapping. Um, so we had a bit more time in the right hemisphere uh, to look more closely at what was going on. But importantly, none of these patients had any infiltration of the precentral gyrus. And what we did was we looked um, at the, um, how at the effects of electrical stimulation um, across the precentral um, cortex, both at rest um, and during ongoing task execution. And then we had a look um, at where these sites corresponded with um, diffusion tractography, with fibers um, delineated using diffusion tractography. So first of all, um, we had a look at the hand when it was at rest. So we were trying to elicit here positive motor effects. Uh, and each patient was tested both on the anterior and the posterior border of the recent cortex. And it was clear that the motor threshold, which is the minimum intensity that's needed to produce an MEP, was much higher on the posterior border. So, uh, so far so good. Um, we would expect that on that side, we would be much closer to cortical motor neuronal fibers um, and so this, this um, sort of makes sense so far. But what was interesting was that we also um, showed that there were negative effects. Um, so on that anterior border, it was also possible to elicit negative effects um, when the hand was on, uh, the ongoing movement was, um, was taking place. So either the hand was fully arrested um, in a sort of classic uh, negative effect, so the hand, um, the hand was arrested fully, or you had a mix between positive and negative effects. So for example, you could have um, the hand stopping movement, moving, as you can see here, um, and contractions occurring in the arm. Um, so yeah, this is just a video of the suppression. I think I showed you that already. So then yeah, the hand moves again. So having a look at the white matter connections um, was also intriguing. So in addition to corticospinal fibers um, that project uh, from the precentral um, gyrus, there's also um, a big cluster of U-shaped um, local connections between adjacent gyri. So in this um, paper um, by uh, my previous group, um, this in white, you can see the central sulcus and um, the colored sets of connections are direct connections between the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus, so primary motor and primary somatics. And what's interesting when you look at these sets of connections is that they seem to be somatotopically organized. Specifically, um, they're concentrated in the hand area. Um, so there's this large set of connections in the hand area um, that may have um, functional purpose. It's very likely they have a functional purpose. And when we had a look at this um, in the, oh, I've got some message coming through. Oops, it's okay. Uh, when we had a look at these connections, um, we could see that uh, the, on the anterior bank, there are sets of connections that um, connect the precentral gyrus with adjacent premotor areas, so with the SMA and with the middle frontal gyrus. And on the uh, posterior border, so closer to the corticospinal um, output, corticomotor neuronal output, there are sets of um, precentral, postcentral connections similar to the ones in the in the previous picture. So it may be um, that this uh, anatomical pattern reflects um, the functional subdivision that we found. And the importance of this is that it may, um, we, we have to look at this further, but it's possible um, that it may be possible to encroach, for the surgeon to encroach more within the precentral gyrus um, without actually causing hemiplegia, um, but causing other maybe um, different types of effects. Um, and perhaps this information can help us um, improve and, and push the functional borders um, for resection.
So um, this also raised other interesting questions. Oops, come on, there we go. So does this effect also happen um, during ongoing movement in other frontal cortical areas? Um, so we, we would expect, it's not so surprising that um, you're gonna have an effect on the hand in the hand region. That's fairly um, understandable. But what was actually interesting was that when you test, so on the uh, top left, you can see um, different tested sites in a, a large group of, um, I think around 50 patients. Um, you can see that um, in fact, you can also have disruption to ongoing movement um, in a more ventrolateral site, um, also on the precentral gyrus. So this area is commonly um, referred to as a ventral premotor cortex. This is an area also on the precentral gyrus. And you have a similar um, type of disruption just there. And what stands out um, is that while you have that pattern of um, movement arrest that we've been talking about so far, both in the dorsal and in the ventral sites, in the ventral sites, you also found this other interesting effect, which was a loss of coordination of the fingers. So the ongoing movement was still performed, but it was very clear when you had a look at the EMG patterns and you could see on the video recordings that the fingers were not coordinating themselves exactly as they should. And so, yeah, this was our um, general finding. And the other thing that was interesting um, as a side note is that we didn't find any effect when stimulating the inferior frontal gyrus during this task. So there may be some difference between the earlier, as I mentioned, um, the studies of Luders, um, because he defined uh, the inferior frontal cortex as a negative motor area where that flexion and extension of the arm uh, was disrupted and we, we didn't find its effect. It's just a side note. But I also want to make the point that um, these negative motor effects that, um, are supported by non-invasive studies. So um, repetitive TMS has been used um, to try and make some dissociation between um, dorsal and ventral areas in terms of um, the effect on hand motor control. And what was interesting there um, was th this study was done um, by Marco Devare and colleagues um, using a grip lift task. And they measured um, the lifting force and the grip force. Um, and they compared those two um, aspects. And they showed that um, when you use repetitive TMS over the dorsal premotor area, there was a delay um, in the, the subject being able to lift um, the object. Whereas when TMS was applied on the ventral premotor area, this disrupted the coordination of the fingers to appropriately grasp um, the object. And this, was, this dissociation um, fits quite well with the results that we had. Now, so far, I've only really been talking about results um, on the cortical level. So now I will move to my favorite topic, which is um, white matter connections that are involved. So every time um, we have the surgery, um, being performed, the cortical mapping is performed, but also subcortical mapping. Um, and the subcortical mapping is as key as the cortical mapping. Um, but generally, the subcortical effects are somewhat, somewhat neglected. So we had a look um, at these negative motor effects on the subcortical level to see whether um, we could find similar effects and how that linked to different sets of white matter connections. So we had a look um, at the uh, effects across um, different premotor um, frontal regions in both the left and the right hemisphere um, in 36 patients. So um, this was always when the patient, so if the patient had a lesion in the left hemisphere, they used the right hand to do the task. Um, and if the patient was, had a lesion in the right hemisphere, they used the left hand to do the task. And we recorded all the stimulation sites um, and registered them to a common space. And you can see here just um, very, um, with a binary approach, um, the location of those stimulation sites. Um, so they are always anterior to um, the precentral gyrus. And really they um, are concentrated um, all the way from dorsomedial to ventrolateral um, regions beneath the um, precentral sulcus um, and slightly more anterior. And we then um, had a look at these um, effects a bit more closely. And we had a look at two things. So we looked at the, the EMG patterns 
Um, and we had a look, first of all, at the change in the amount of motor unit recruitment that was required, required to do the task as an average across the three muscles that we measured. And the second thing we had a look at was the thing I mentioned before, which was the change in regularity of the phasic movement. So the coordination of the fingers. Um, and that was done um, just using an autocorrelation coefficient. And so we had a look at, by doing that, we could see that there were actually quite clear distinctions between two types of effect. So um, this movement arrest was a bit more clustered. So I'll show you the video again. Um, was more clustered in the dorsal area, dorsal subcortical area. Whereas the clumsy um, effect could be elicited um, across both dorsal, but moving more into um, ventrolateral areas. So um, there were a lot more results um, that were, the, the results were more widespread for the clumsy sort of loss of coordination effect. Um, but really this was um, also more concentrated, more uh, ventrolateral than the, the dorsal medial sites. And the other interesting thing that was observed was that when you looked at patients that had more than one um, effect, um, so what more than one stimulation site that was effective, um, you could see that the arrest sites were always more dorsal medial than the ventrolateral sites. So there's just an example of that loss of coordination. You can see the fingers clearly can't quite grasp the, the task in the, in the way that it was doing it so perfectly before. So we had a look at the white matter connections that were involved. Um, and what we did was we took each individual stimulation site that was identified um, for each patient during the operation or more than one stimulation site in certain cases. And we used the preoperative diffusion tractography um, and we dissected the premotor tracts um, that were um, the that were all within the area that was there, and this was the um, three major branches of frontoparietal connections, which are called the superior longitudinal fasciculi. Um, the connections of between the um, superior frontal gyrus and the basal ganglion straight, and so frontostriatal connections. Connections between um, the inferior frontal gyrus and the superior frontal gyrus, um, which are, is called the frontal aslan tract, um, and the sets of U-shaped fibers as well. Um, and so we had a look, and also projection fibers. So we had a look at um, direct uh, projections to the brainstem um, from premotor areas, dorsal premotor areas. And so when we did that, we could see that actually there were different clusters of tracts that seemed to have been affected by stimulation. And this may have explained the difference um, in the different types of effect we found. So the, when you had this uh, movement arrest effect, um, this tended to happen when connections extending from the SMA or the pre-SMA um, to the basal ganglia, um, also those projection connections to the brainstem, and also dorsal um, frontoparietal tracts, they seem to be linked um, to um, th this effect. Also, these sites were very strongly associated with um, those dorsal U-shaped fibers, um, those connections between the precentral gyrus and um, adjacent uh, middle frontal gyrus and um, SMA. And on the other hand, um, the loss of coordination effect that um, we found, so these more ventral patterns, tended to be associated mainly with um, uh, the, the most ventral branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects um, the precentral gyrus and the um, posterior inferior frontal gyrus with um, the parietal lobe, so with the um, posterior parietal regions. So um, this shows that, that there was some quite clear distinction. Um, and we tried to theorize on why this might be. So in the dorsal area, um, these connections um, are the, the parietal lobe connections, the basal ganglia connections, um, but really the, the fact that you had these um, local connections directly with the precentral gyrus um, and these basal ganglia connections and the projection fibers, we would imagine that this area um, is very likely involved in final stages of motor output. Um, so it seems as though that area synthesizes um, motor, sensory motor information at the very final stage, which is why you have such a dramatic effect um, on the movement. Whereas in the ventral area, 
um, we have this loss of movement coordination. So the action is still being performed, um, but the fingers just don't coordinate each other, it, it coordinate themselves um, as well as they should. Um, and we theorize that this is because um, it's, to, it's more related to hand shaping and perhaps it is the transfer of um, sensory or haptic information from the parietal lobe that's being di disrupted. And perhaps this is occurring at an earlier stage, so the action can still be performed um, and compensated for, but it just causes this more mild hand shaping problem. So this ties in quite well, um, this, this ventral finding, um, with findings that have been observed in the monkey. Um, and in fact, um, this provides some, possibly some causal evidence that um, these frontoparietal tracts may be involved in coordination of movement. Um, in monkeys, um, there's this tract that runs between what's called AIP um, in the parietal lobe and F5, which is directly linked um, as a sort of primary uh, uh, set a connection for sensory motor integration. And when you inactivate either of these cortical sectors, you get this similar um, disruption of hand shaping for grasping, although the execution of the finger movements is preserved. So it's likely um, if we can make direct homologues between the monkey and the human, um, that perhaps these similar sets of connections may mediate the same thing in the human. And a lot less work has been done in the human, but um, one nice study, um, although indirect, um, has studied the um, inter-individual differences in the volume um, of these tracts with um, different pr uh, kinematic parameters um, during grasping and reaching, um, and has linked this ventral branch to um, grasping movements, um, which they measured um, with kinematics. So um, this, this, these results may provide a bit more evidence to support the role of these tracts. Um, but what's also interesting is this dorsal medial area. So this is a bit more tricky to interpret um, because our results indicated that the stimulation um, occurred at a site of convergence um, between a number of tracks um, and this is what caused the arrest of the hand movement. So um, this was linked to the stimulation of those local U-shaped connections which is, ties in nicely with our previous study um, but also uh, it may be linked to connections with the basal ganglia, um, the frontal striatal tracts, projection tracts. And this is really one of the um, challenges of uh, looking at subcortical stimulation because we know that there are crossing fibers um, in around 90% of the brain. Um, so it's, it's really quite challenging to know whether um, one connection in particular is responsible for um, the effect. Um, and certain, the cortical effects can give us some clues onto that, but um, it's difficult to ever say 100% um, that it's related to one tract. Um, also, it's very likely that one tract does not mediate one function. Um, there's probably a number of tracts that work together to mediate it. Um, but with these um, caveats in mind, um, our results still provide some causal evidence that these fibres seem to be linked um, directly to movement control. As a final point, um, we had a look at the resection of these different connections and how this was lim uh, linked to movement deficits. So we had a look in, the, in our sample of patients, um, but the challenge was that none of these patients really had um, motor deficits because um, the tool was being used. So when you find these um, site that gives you a, an effect on the hand movement or, or stops the hand movement, then this area will be preserved. So bear, bearing that in mind, that means the deficit is usually pretty low. Um, and so we looked at very few of the patients that had deficit and all of those had uh, transient deficit of five days, but they recovered by one month. Um, and here you can see the results of the different tracts um, in each individual patient. So um, the a vertical line shows the percentage of disconnection of each um, tract and along the horizontal is the different patients. In red you can see the group of patients that have um, the deficit and you can see that um, in those patients those U-shaped fibres are resected, um, the SMA fibres, uh, the projection fibres are, are resected um, also the frontal aslant tracts, um, the frontal striatal tracts, 
um, and the dorsal uh, frontal parietal tract also. Um, but what's really very interesting is that the patients in yellow who had no deficit, um, in all of those patients pretty much, um, or most majority of them, the frontal Aslan tract was resected and they had no um, problems. Um, similarly, frontal striatal tracts um, were resected in around half of those patients um, without deficits. And um, in, again, the uh, frontal parietal tracts could be um, uh, resected and they didn't seem to have many deficits. So although we still regard this results as very, these results as very preliminary, um, it, show, it may show some evidence that the, um, or some preliminary evidence that the U-shaped fibers may have a more important role um, and deserve a bit more study. So just to summarize, um, I hope I've made it clear that uh, direct electrical stimulation is a very useful approach for preserving cognitive functions. Um, and the way that this can be best used um, is to try and do um, mapping that's anatomically appropriate. Um, and this is best approached by um, trying to do some retrospective study of um, what's been going on so we can get a lot of information from fMRI and TMS. But when we want to look subcortically, uh, really, we have to um, we have to try and uh, use more invasive approaches, um, and this approach is very interesting. We also um, need to try and develop more reliable interoperative tests, and there's a range of um, cognitive functions that are not being tested for at the moment. And as an example, um, I just showed one of our a set, a series of our work um, using this very simple test, um, and though it's very simple. It's um, quite powerful for dissociating different functional effects in different regions. Um, you can do that within a very small area um, across the precentral cortex, um, but also you can see these different effects along the precentral cortex. Um, and furthermore, we showed that there's this a similar um, pattern of, um, of effect on the subcortical level, but in the white matter far below um, the cortex. Um, much more anterior. So thank you for listening um, and I look forward to your questions and I would also like to thank all of our team in Milan um, and yeah, you know. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought it was a great talk. Um, so I will go on now and ask a question and we do have uh, we do have one question. So someone is asking, um, M1 is a stimulation target for pain. Um, is it known where along the anterior posterior gradient is best for pain? And do your results help inform this? For pain? Sorry, could you repeat Correct. the question? Correct, yeah. yeah. So M1 is a stimulation target for pain. Is it known where along the AP gradient is best for pain and do your results help inform this? To be honest, we, our patients don't report pain. Um, we, we have never tested for pain. It's an interesting thing to explore. Um, but we are, I, I would say that have, I've been to an, a lot of operations um, and I've never had any patient report pain um, either during the execution of this task um, or during any stimulation of the precentral gyrus. Um, so, yeah, it would definitely be something to, but it may be that the reason they haven't re is reported it is because they haven't been asked to report it, but it'd be something that's worth exploring. Um, we'll have a look into it. Okay, cool. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, yes. so, <laughs> so the first one, uh, I'm not sure what is the degree of um, like deformation of the brain when it's like open, like, uh, mm -hmm. but how do you address like registration in that case? Brain um, shift. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely a big problem. And so um, this was my, yeah, I spent a long time working on this problem um, and Actually, I found that the, the, way, the way that we do it is that we use a, a couple of approaches to try and do it. So we do an interoperative recording um, all the way through the surgery. Um, and by doing that, we can see the angle of the probe going in. Um, and it also provides some estimate of the depth of the um, probe and how, how deep the probe is going in. And so using that, we try and make estimates. 
The other thing is that we know, I mean, the, the, group, um, the Defoe group, for example, the way that they do this is by, um, is by using the border of the resection. Because you, whenever the, whenever the um, subcortical stimulation is done, when you find the effect, um, the surgeon then puts a piece of sort of cotton inside to record the exact site of where that's happened. Um, and that's done um, through the surgery. And then they use the neural navigator and place the um, stimulator in to record the exact site where that's happened. And that, so you have an interoperative site that's been recorded on the neural navigator. You have a video recording. Um, and then you have the um, post-operative MRI. And on the post-operative MRI, you can see usually quite a sharp border where, um, so I wonder if you can probably see it in one of my previous pictures. Let me see if I can be in here. Um, yeah, you can see quite a clear um, turn. And this is almost always where the simulation site is. Um, so then when, you, when it comes to registration, you have a different set of um, problems when you want to register that to a common template. Um, but identifying, being sure of where you are subcortically is actually less difficult um, than you might think. Thanks for your question. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Um, we have more questions coming. So, yeah. uh, yay. So, Laura asks, have you investigated functional connectivity using the same seeds identified during your surgery? And if yes, how did they differ from structural connectivity? Yes, we have actually. And we've got um, a nice paper by our group um, by Luciano Simona, who used, we, ha we don't do um, resting state with the patients, but what we did was we used those sectors and we compared, we used the HCP data um, to try and have a look at the resting state um, functional connectivity and see um, how those related and what the differences were. Um, and he showed different patterns of connections between that dorsal area and the ventral area. Um, but we, and we did also show in that paper um, differences in stimulation sites as well, actually. Um, sorry, differences in tractography. Um, but again, we didn't have individual subject level data. Um, but yeah, I, the paper is in NeuroImage and came out this year. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Things. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds interesting. So, um, and then another one, um, someone is asking, do you make a distinction between gross versus motor um, effects in the implicated pathways? Not sure. Sorry, a difference between motor and grasping effects. Um, maybe that's what he meant, because I read between gross versus fine. Oh, sorry. Between gross versus fine motor effects in implicated pathways. Um, my by fine motor effects, um, I mean, a, a, a grasping deficit would be defined as a fine motor effect, I think. Um, but I mean, there are other, I suppose there are other more um, subtle effects. So there could be somatosensory effects. Um, I, th I mean, a grasping deficit is quite a clear way um, of testing it. In, I mean, interoperatively, we've only been using this grasping tool, um, but there are a number of other tests you can use. So other tests for fine motor skill, um, you can have a look at uh, finger tapping, I suppose. Um, or peg placing. Um, but the other thing that's important is that this is a haptically driven test. Um, so uh, we aren't testing visually guided information, uh, in, in visually guided systems. So that would be another area to have a look at. Um, all right, he's asking again, fine motor as speech? Fine motor, fine motor speech deficits versus growth. Grasping. Yes, um, so actually in the ventral area, um, you can see both um, motor speech deficits and um, uh, hand motor deficits. And we actually explored this in a pre, or, um, my boss explored this in a previous paper um, called the strange case of Broca's area um, and had a look at the difference between um, speech motor deficits and um, hand motor deficits, but it's a very interesting area, particularly in that ventral area, because it may be effect A specific. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Edda.
for your talk. And thank you everybody for, uh, if there are no more questions, if nobody has any more questions to ask, um, thank you for, uh, for joining us today, um, for joining the webinar. There will be more, um, more speakers coming up and we'll announce them through the newsletter. So yeah, thank you.